Welcome back to another review of Desperate Housewives. I'm Serena for those of you that are new here and I'm super excited to be doing this series with you because I'm pretty sure it's the only one on YouTube that talks about this show. I'll link to my previous two videos about this show in the description but in this video specifically we're covering season three and four so this is probably going to be a long one. I have to say though that I loved season three. It's my favorite season so far. I thought it was amazing. Desperate House Housewives reminds me a lot of other shows I've seen like Dead to Me and Big Little Lies which is one of the reasons I'm enjoying it so much but I was surprised by how much I fell in love with season three and four as a response to the series problematic and criticized second season Mark Sherry decided to fast forward six months for the season three premiere. Why have I been calling him Mark Sherry this whole time? Oh my god he's not a wine. Anyway he said that he regretted most of season two because due to scheduling problems it made it harder for him to plan ahead in terms of the plot. The cast also expressed disappointment about the second season. James Denton who plays Mike considered leaving the show so as a result season three was a huge improvement. The character I thought that I'd start off with is Susan. She's probably the most disliked out of all the women and if you look at the the Reddit page for Desperate Housewives there's a whole flair called Susan Meyer hate and there isn't one for the other women but so far I'm still liking her character in season three. She's definitely the funniest out of the main women to me at least. I feel like her comedic timing is always excellent and it's really funny when she puts herself in awkward situations. They definitely brought back the more traditional romance story between Susan and Mike that was present in season one and missing in season two which I really appreciate. Appreciated. There is a love triangle in season three between Susan and Ian and Mike. Ian's a new character that's introduced who Susan meets in the hospital because she's visiting Mike who's in a coma from a hit and run. Ian has a wife who's in a coma and they both kind of find comfort in each other and at this point Mike's been in a coma for six months so Susan feels like maybe it's time to let go of him and move on because she doesn't know if he'll ever wake up and this love triangle created a lot of opportunity for comedic moments I thought. But in in the media male on male rivalry or fighting over a woman is often very romanticized and seen as cute but the minute that it's two women fighting over a man's attention it's called a cat fight or boyfriend stealing and I think that shows the sexist double standard we have in society when it comes to things like this. Ian and Mike were going behind each other's backs at points or they were betting on Susan in a poker game or they were doing various things that should be considered catty but yet you don't hear people calling it catty and I just think that's really interesting because if it was Susan and let's say Edie fighting over a guy doing basically the same thing people would probably be be a lot more critical of their two characters and say that it was desperate and pathetic. Whereas I don't ever see Mike really getting a lot of hate for effectively trying to take Susan away from her boyfriend. But I really thoroughly enjoyed a lot of Susan's scenes in season three. I thought that Mike was given way more sass and personality than he had in season two. And I loved that Susan got over her ego issue around wanting this big fancy wedding when Mike isn't someone that can provide that for her. So when she eventually ends up separating from her boyfriend Ian and going back to Mike again, when they do get married at the end of the season, she's comfortable with having a more simple and heartfelt wedding and I felt like that was really beautiful. But let's just retrace our steps so you guys can kind of follow what's going on because I know it's a very messy plot, it's very complicated. At the beginning of season three, Susan is devastated because Mike is in a coma. He was hit by Orson who's a new character that's just been introduced into the series and we don't really know what Orson's motive is. When Mike wakes up Susan isn't there at the time Edie's there. Edie's character really takes a turn for the worse and I'll get into that later. I didn't like it but Edie comes to the hospital and she's really glad that she can be there when Mike wakes up because she and Susan have always had a bit of a rivalry over Mike. She just sees the opportunity to manipulate Mike so she starts messing with his memories and making out that him and Susan were never actually that serious and Susan wasn't the best girlfriend anyway and using it as a way to get close to Mike because he's vulnerable and 
he doesn't have his memories. He's actually suffering from some sort of amnesia due to his accident. When Susan catches Mike and Edie making out, it really hurts her and it causes her to go to Ian and pursue something more serious with him because she just can't do it anymore. And I do feel that she gave up very easily on Mike, like she just let Edie win. I did think it was really funny, Susan's reaction when she found out that Mike and Edie were together because it obviously put a huge damper on her day. So she went to see Lynette who'd also had a bad day and they sat there drinking and Susan was trying to theorize ways to kill Edie without going to prison. And then she made this comment like, oh, I wish Paul Young was here. He'd know what to do. At this point, I wasn't sure about what my feelings towards Ian were. So I wasn't mad that Susan was dating him, but I grew up in England and it really bothered me how Ian basically fits into every British stereotype there is. He has this very posh accent. He has a lovely big fancy house and a butler. His wife got injured in a horse riding accident. And they also really dragged out him and Susan storylines. I felt like their arc could have been over in about four episodes but it took up way too much time. I know Mike could be considered a boring character as well but I feel like he's not at all because everyone in this show is so intense and reactive and dramatic that it's so nice to have a grounded stable character like Mike who's consistent and calm and just a good guy. I find it very refreshing whereas Ian to me was more pompous and annoying. It was really gross of him to propose to Susan only because he thought that Mike had tried to propose to Susan before the coma so Ian feels threatened or something like he's trying to prove himself. And then Susan meets Ian's longtime butler and colleague who starts being horrible to Susan slut shaming her because the butler has this idea in his head that Ian is still technically committed to his wife and therefore he's cheating or something. <laughs> Ian just ignores it and acts like it's not a big deal or laughs it off and then when he does address it it's not with half as much defensiveness as it should be like he should want to protect his girlfriend from that it's just not very attractive <laughs> that he would just sit back and let her fend for herself for the most part. Susan was fully committed to Ian I do believe and she was very happy to go and move to London with him if she needed to but what pushed her away was his paranoia. I also felt like the situation was more complicated morally than just a normal cheating storyline because cheating is always wrong, trying to take someone away from their partner is wrong. But Mike had been in a coma and lost his memories. He didn't know how much he loved Susan until his memories started coming back and by that point she was already with Ian and I think Mike was trying to get her back before she was married to Ian and it was too late so it wasn't really fully his fault. Susan definitely still played a part in the problems with her relationship with Ian and she definitely was playing both of the guys and making it way more complicated than it needed to be. Ian asked Susan specifically not to see Mike anymore and it was like Susan couldn't respect his wishes and she kept finding excuses to go and talk to Mike and she keeps almost bouncing between the two of them and then when one of them rejects her she goes back to the other one and she can't actually make a firm decision. After rejecting Mike for Ian she then decides she doesn't want Ian and then runs back to Mike and Mike was so happy to just take her back she literally just dropped him a day earlier for another guy but I am glad that she chose Mike in the end and that it worked out because I think they're so much of a better couple and I've rooted for them right from the beginning in the same way that I've rooted for Orson and Brie right from the beginning because there's definitely a connection there and her and Ian played into each other's insecurities right from the beginning. They were on this romantic weekend getaway and they should be in like the honeymoon stage. They shouldn't be particularly critical of each other. I feel like that's something that only happens in the later stage of a relationship where you do really fully realize that the person has flaws and they're not perfect. He found out how many people she'd slept with which was 11 and he started making her feel really bad about about it to the point that at first she lied and said she'd only slept with nine people because she thought that maybe he'd approve of that more so she didn't feel comfortable. She's like 39 so her sleeping with 11 people isn't that incomprehensible to me. I think she started having sex pretty young too at like 16 so if you think about that it's not that weird. Another storyline that was very key in season three is Susan learns that 
her daughter Julie is now back on the dating scene again and she's dating Austin who's like the local bad boy and Edie's nephew which really bothers Susan because she doesn't like Edie that much first of all but also she feels that her daughter is too young for this especially if she's having sex. Sometimes Susan struggles to manage Julie correctly and she's definitely a pretty negligent parent in that sense and she only has one kid to look after. Now season four is a bit of a different story but I'll get into that later because we're not talking about that right now but I do want to discuss Gabby next in season three. Now where we left off she'd just been cheated on by Carlos. By the way I'm really sorry if I mix Gabby slash Gabrielle's name up with Danielle who's Bree's daughter. Apparently I did that in the last video I'm really sorry but Gabby and Carlos are fighting a lot in the beginning of season three. They're feuding, they're wanting to divorce even though they're simultaneously divorcing there's clearly still feelings there because there's a lot of passion in their arguments and everything. Thing. and Gabby keeps trying to hurt Carlos by showing that she's dating different men and the whole thing was very weird. I thought they were super toxic at the beginning of season three and I was really happy when they finalized it and actually separated. But then Carlos starts to calm down a bit and they have some time apart and he definitely starts to become a better character and that's the first time I've ever said that in the entire series because I didn't really like him earlier. I thought he was horrible and misogynistic and shallow. When they're apart I feel like they're so much better and there are quite a few scenes where they start to form a friendship again and warm up to each other and then Gabby starts fake dating Zach Young who's Mike's biological son and Zach was a total creep in season one but you have no idea him in season three is another level. First of all that hair is crusty. I can't take him seriously like what the hell he looks so weird but also his attitude is just off because he's gotten really rich and made a bunch of money so he's very arrogant and he doesn't know how to relate to women normally at all and he's decided he wants to seduce Gabby. I mean he is of a legal age but it's still very disturbing and also there was this really gross scene where she woke up in bed with him shirtless and he was trying to make out that they'd slept together to try and manipulate her into thinking maybe she was attracted to him and obviously that wasn't true. There were multiple points like twice where he literally sexually assaulted her and kissed her without her consent or just made an unwanted move. Another storyline in season three is Carlos realizing he still has feelings for Gabby and trying to get her back. I was not mad about it. I thought it was sweet. He was being less unhealthily terrified tutorial around her and more grounded like he's definitely toned down the anger management issues. He cheated on her in the finale of season two. Now he's trying to get her back. If he likes her this much why did he cheat on her in the first place and now he's realizing all along she's the woman for him. Like if you like her that much then why did you cheat on her? That doesn't really make much sense to me. Victor Lang, a candidate running for mayor, starts flirting with Gabrielle and he's quite a bit older than her. He's got like gray hairs. He's probably like God, I don't want to get this wrong, 50 or 60? Some people would consider it a little bit weird, like he's trying to win her as his young wife or something because the minute he looks at her, he's like, I want to marry that woman, which I found a little weird. <laughs> No, he didn't say I want to, he said I'm going to. She's not even playing hard to get, she is hard to get because she's not actually interested. But then he does a few things that show he has a heart and she realizes that. She likes him more when he's not putting on this act and when he's just being himself. As he got to know her, he realized, wait, we're not like actually that compatible. She's not cut out for his political lifestyle, nor does she understand it or want to understand it. And she might actually do more damage to his campaign than good. And and she also doesn't understand his lifestyle, how hard he needs to work, how much money he needs to make, the fact that he can't make time for her 24 seven and she can't handle that because she already had that with Carlos. That's why she cheated on him with the teenage gardener because she felt completely ignored and I don't think she wanted a repeat of that situation, which is fair enough, like I get it, but at the same time Gabby is very high maintenance and just because Carlos didn't make time for you that's something you should talk to him about. You don't go and become a total pedo. I did think that Victor was a very weirdly written character though and his motives were very poor. One minute they wanted it to seem like he's very shallow and just trying to seduce her. Like after they sleep together for the first time he doesn't call her which is insanely disrespectful but the next minute he's saying I'm in love with you and he seems to mean it and then the next minute 
he's actually not making time for her. But then right at the end he's saying I need you to love me and all I've ever wanted is for you to want me and so his intentions seem genuine again but despite their ups and downs they end up getting engaged and then married in the finale of season three. Gabby realizes that she actually doesn't like him that much because it seemed like he was only dating her because he thought she'd make him look good for his voters. It was very bad but rather than talking to him about it Gabby goes and cheats on him with Carlos. Season three was probably my favorite season for her for sure but she's still a bit of a shitty person like to put it lightly. I still haven't forgotten about what she did to John Rowland the gardener in season one and she actually met him again in season three which I find really gross like this dude keeps coming back and there's definitely an expectation for female characters to be perfect and then when male characters have flaws it's what makes us love them more or think they're complicated or something. So I don't mind that Gabby's a shitty person Person. but I do think it's weird when people say she's a good person or try to justify her behavior. She's also really mean in season three like she becomes super power hungry when she gets with Victor because she realizes that she has this status as the mayor's wife and she loves the idea of being able to do illegal things or get away with stuff because she gets a free pass and she loves the ego boost of knowing that Carlos has a crush on her and her being unavailable to him. She also really pissed me off when she was doing her wedding planning because she started copying Susan's wedding plans to Ian which is so wrong. I'm talking down to the flower bouquets, the aesthetics of it, and she wasn't telling her. And then when Susan was pissed off, she was like, oh, I can pay you money for your planning or whatever. Like, no, you can't just take someone's creative, intimate, ideas that's personal to them for their wedding and then recreate it for yours. Susan was right to be pissed off with her about that like that's just such a disrespectful and messed up thing to do. So Gabby does this a lot you know where she thinks she's entitled to certain things just because she's Gabby. The next one I want to talk about is Edie in terms of characters and I have to say that out of all the characters in season three I was disappointed with Edie takes the cake. Edie was originally introduced as a recurring character in season one. She's in and out of the show, she has her sassy one-liners and disappears again. They realized how great she was and they started to bring her back as a series regular. It's different to a movie. With a movie once it's done it's done but with a series you can gauge public reaction and make changes along the way which can sometimes actually ruin your work because you start listening too much to what the fans want rather than what is effective for the art. But in this case I think it was a good decision to make Edie part of the main cast. She's an excellent character but not in season three. <laughs> In season three Edie went down the drain. I'm so done with her it's not even funny. Edie just keeps taking other people's dirty laundry and by that I mean ex-boyfriends. Edie and Carlos are a thing in season three. Oh my god. She tries to date Orson I think in season four and then we've got Mike, Susan's first husband she tried to take. There's something so weird about it don't you think when there's a pattern like this and I know there's a bro code. There's definitely rules around that but it's the same for girl code. Like if she has any respect for these women and she wants them to like her and she's apparently so sad she doesn't have friends she's not doing a very good job of making making friends is she? Rule 101. Don't date someone's ex-husband. It's weird. Her dating Mike was properly crossing the line though because it's not just like dating him, it was seducing him and manipulating him and messing with his memories and changing photos. Also I find it hard to believe logically that Edie could so easily trick Mike and take him away from Susan. If Susan saw this happening, which she did, she could have just asked her friends and neighbors to come by, talk to Mike in a big group, back up her story and then Mike would realize it was all of their words against Edie's but instead Susan just sort of lets him go. She ends up dating Carlos in season three as well and these two were just such a terrible couple. One minute he's saying he wants a serious relationship and then he starts saying that he just wants some fun with Edie and she's meant to be the fun single one but now she's pathetically desperate for a boyfriend, desperate to make Carlos love her and commit to her to not just be seen as this casual thing. They took up way too much screen time, it was ridiculous and they were boring. Carlos never treated Edie well from the beginning and it seemed like he only wanted to be with her because we 
found out that Edie has a child from a previous relationship. Carlos is almost enjoying spending time with the three of them like a happy little family and he's always wanted a kid but that doesn't mean he wants Edie it means it's just his wish fulfillment around having a family because Gabby never wanted kids. He was taking way too long to break up with Edie too and sort of keeping Gabby hanging around when he really wanted to be with Gabby and then when Gabby asked why Carlos was still sleeping with Edie he said because I'm a guy as if that justifies it. Forget Carlos for a second what Edie does to try and keep him is appalling. Carlos wasn't taking her seriously he wasn't treating her right and it's like she loses all of her bad bitch energy and all her self-respect and she just grovels to try and get him to want her it's so sad she fakes suicide hoping he'll stay with her out of guilt she basically proposes to herself and then tries to blackmail him into being engaged then when she's annoyed and feeling rejected she goes to Victor and she shows him photos of Gabby and Carlos kissing and she says Gabby's cheating on you hoping that he'll hurt Carlos and hurt Gabby even though Victor's a dangerous man and should not have that information then she used Carlos's money to buy things without his permission and then she faked that she wanted to get pregnant with him and have a child with him to deceive him and trap him into a relationship then she knew that Carlos wanted a son so she tried to get her son to move closer and stick around even though it was inconveniencing her kid and the worst part of it all is how delusional she is because I think she says to Gabby in the next season if you're not going to treat Carlos right there's plenty of women who will I think I proved that so she learned nothing and still thinks somehow that she was good to him. I did not like her in season three and I really hope she will get better. Another character <laughs> who pissed me off in season three was Lynette. Lynette was my second least favorite in season three. Not as bad as Edie but boy was she getting on my nerves. The second half of season three is the worst of Lynette's moments by far. At first like I said Lynette was doing fine. She meets Nora who she thought Tom was cheating on her with with on her what <laughs> she thought Tom was cheating on her with Nora but Nora was just an old flame of Tom's who ended up getting pregnant and having his kid Tom didn't know about this so now she's getting to know Nora and the new kid because the kid is going to be a part of their lives the child's called Kayla and it's stressful for Lynette because she's got enough kids and Kayla isn't even biologically hers but at the same time it is Tom's kid the mum is very unwell I don't know what's wrong with her but she's just very mean and all over the place and intense with her emotions and just very hard to handle and quite paranoid too she definitely accuses Lynette of having really awful intentions when it's not accurate to what's going on but then Nora actually ends up dying which is very hard because it means that Kayla is super traumatized and blames Lynette for her mum's death and how it all happens is in this amazing episode called Bang which features a supermarket shooting I thought this was one of the best episodes of the series because it was so different since that episode was such a success they've started trying to introduce more disaster episodes like every season but Bang was a pivotal episode for Lynette's character development and it was really nice because often in season one and two Lynette kind of was on the back burner when it came to storylines and hers just weren't as good as the other girls but in Bang Lynette is like at the forefront of the episode and she's important she's the only one of the main girls who's actually trapped in the supermarket with Nora when the shooting is happening the event gives her a big moment of closure around Mary Alice's death the woman who died at the beginning of season one who was a friend of theirs they don't really mention Mary Alice anymore because it's season three now so maybe Lynette was closer to her than the other women were. Carolyn the woman who was the shooter was about to shoot Lynette as well then a new neighbor saves Lynette's life and Lynette is super grateful for this so the next episode she bakes a thank you cake for this new neighbor and she feels very emotional about the whole experience. The new neighbor is called Art Shepherd. she thinks that he may be a pedophile because he has lots of photos of shirtless boys. Now in a way it made sense because it looked very bad. She mentions it to someone and then the whole neighborhood is talking about this guy and protesting and saying he's dangerous which makes Lynette guilty because of course what she saw was weird and should be investigated but it's not solid proof. We don't actually know for sure an innocent man may be accused of something he didn't do. Then she goes to talk to Art about it but he's actually going to move away because the whole neighborhood hates him and he blames Lynette. He then gets really creepy with Lynette and threatens to 
to resort to his emotions for kids and stuff now that his sister's dead. Why would you threaten her with something like that? If you want to prove that you're not a bad guy, don't give her ammunition to think that you're a bad guy. Why would you say that? But it really bothered me that he just disappears from the show and they never actually explain what the deal was with that. I still felt like Lynette was compelling. She was doing her best. She made mistakes as we all do. But in the second half of season three, that's when things really go sour for Lynette big time and I just could no longer support her. The emotional cheating happens. Yes, you heard that right. Now, as I mentioned in my previous reviews, Lynette is paranoid about Tom cheating on her to the point that she follows him like a stalker if she thinks he's doing something wrong. At least I could respect that these are her morals. She just feels really strongly about loyalty and fidelity and not cheating and that's just one of her things. I can respect that. That's her moral compass. But I guess the rules only apply to Tom and not to her. Lynette hires this new chef called Rick and she starts having feelings for him. And I guess that's okay because it's her what? Are you kidding me? She's flirting with him and she's spending all this time hanging out with him, pretending she's working after the pizzeria is closed because Tom sets up this pizzeria place, right? So she's there with this new chef working with him and collaborating and she's really involved with Tom's pizzeria. So she keeps making these excuses like, oh, I'm busy. We're organizing the menu. But she's basically on a dinner date with this Rick guy. They're just sitting over a meal and talking about nothing. And she should be home with her husband looking after her kids but she's not. Night after night she's doing that, forming this emotional attachment to Rick. She has multiple opportunities to set boundaries, to say, sorry, I'm not available, but she doesn't, which is leading Rick on because he'll think, cool, she wants me. And then she's pissed off at him for making it real and saying it aloud. She's like, why would you say that? The only person she should be mad at is herself. Of course he was going to say, you know, I have a huge crush on you because you were leading into that, weren't you? I know this is a soap opera, so of course it's going to be dramatic, but I just can't stand Tom and Lynette anymore. I think they are the most toxic couple in the entire series. The best thing for them to do would be to just divorce. I mean, they're fighting constantly and neither of them wants to tell the other what's on their mind. So they go behind the other person's back to do things. Like Tom wanted to see a marriage counsellor with Lynette but he was worried she wouldn't want to so he secretly brings in a counsellor pretending it's a friend to try and let them have a marriage counselling session without her realising it was one. Then Lynette is pathetically salty and upset over the fact that she had to fire Rick because she misses him. Wah. So she's there crying in the bathroom and for weeks on end is in a sour mood, missing Rick and resenting Tom because she had to fire Rick. She was just annoying me with how she interacts with Tom in general. I feel like she can be a real buzzkill and just really negative. She's really disrespectful to him when it came to opening their business together. She's the boss at home. She tells him what to do and they agreed that at work it would be the other way around and he's the boss of the pizzeria. So she reports to him and that's why he gets to not be emasculated for once and he gets to actually be dominant sometimes, which could be good, like a healthy balance. But Lynette cannot let go of control. So even though they had that agreement, at work she keeps talking back to him and even making fun of him and undermining him in front of his employees. She also keeps whinging about needing to wear the uniform he asked her to and making it into this big deal when it's not. Lynette's actress is definitely the best out of all the women in the main cast so I thought it was really sad that she was being made so unlikable but I did have hope for her in season four that she would be better because right in the finale of season three she finds out that she probably has cancer, which could be a life-changing experience for her potentially and make her rethink her choices. But the final character I want to talk about is Brie before I get into the plot of season three. Brie was totally my favorite in season two and I thought she was amazing compared to the uptight, emotionally repressed woman we meet in season one. And season three was yet again an amazing season for Brie and she was 100% my favorite character in season three, like if I had to rank the women. She marries Orson and he's a very suspicious man and he is the center of the mystery aspect of the show in season three because every season follows a new kind of mystery and as a result it was amazing because she's married to him but we don't know whether we can trust him 
or not. But at the same time, they have a really great relationship and great chemistry. And I think he totally adores her and it's actually really sweet. She finally starts to heal her relationship with her son, Andrew, in season three, which was so emotional for me. I nearly cried because all of season one and two, it's just them hating each other. And finally, they're coming to an understanding in season three where he starts to care for her again and love her. And she's too stupid to notice it, but he's actually warming up to her again. And I thought that was amazing considering he was basically one of the main villains of season two. Andrew in season three is like genuinely amazing. He's one of my favorite characters. His one-liners, his sass, his wit was just amazing. And then in the finale of season three, the character of Brie is seemingly pregnant. Her daughter, Danielle, hooked up with Austin, who was actually meant to be Julie's boyfriend at the time. By the way, side note, Danielle's probably one of my least favorite characters in the series. Like she's a piece of trash. I literally can't with her. Danielle had admitted that after hooking up with Austin, she thinks she may be pregnant. And so I had a very strong feeling that Brie was faking her pregnancy so that then when her daughter had her baby, Brie could pretend it was her baby because Brie would hate the shame of needing to admit to people that her teenage daughter got pregnant. And Brie's really into impression management. And I ended up being right, by the way. Brie never mentioned wanting more kids and she's getting older now. So the chances of her wanting to be pregnant again seemed pretty slim to me. So it makes sense if she's faking it. But now, now, what I want to talk about is the mystery aspect of season three. I actually think it's worth recapping. It was really juicy. In episode one, Brie and Orson become engaged and we knew that they'd hit it off earlier. We've missed huge chunks of their relationship developing, but we see flashes of them together and we see them kissing in the rain and all this. And it seems to be like a whirlwind relationship. The show is very clever with its misdirection into making you think that Orson is evil because it shows a scene of him with his first wife and they make it sound like he killed her. And I was worried that Brie was going to be his next victim. And Brie hardly has a good track record with the men in her life. I mean, she had Rex, her first husband, who was really rude and distant and horrible and annoying. And then we had George, who was like a crazy stalker and she didn't even notice. So I did not have high hopes for Orson at all, considering her history and her poor judgment, right? I was scared for her, but it's not what you think. Carolyn, that neighbor who ends up doing the shooting in the supermarket, literally said that Orson killed his first wife, Alma. That makes Brie freak out. And there's basically this continual storyline unfolding throughout the season of the evidence piling up against Orson and him looking really bad in Brie's eyes. And meanwhile, Mike is being framed for something that looks like a murder because Mike's linked to it. It makes Susan and Brie have a fight because Susan thinks that Orson is responsible for what Mike's being framed for and Brie wants to defend her husband Orson so it creates this rivalry between Brie and Susan where they're both understandably trying to back up their men. There's this unidentified body found whose teeth are missing and Orson claims not to know who it is but he does know it's actually his dead ex-lover Monique. He was dating her when he was already married to Alma. He's actually trying to protect someone so he's not saying what's going Going on. He is incriminated in a murder, but he wasn't the actual killer and he did not kill Alma and he did not kill his lover Monique. Orson's mum comes to town and she's very suspicious and very nasty. But since she and Orson are both so aggressive towards each other and always threatening to blackmail each other, it makes it really hard to tell who's good and who's evil or if they're both evil. But then suddenly, Orson's ex-wife Alma arrives in town and she's completely fine. And that was really odd because she basically disappeared and now she's okay. And she seems to just want to win Orson back. But then you realize there's this alliance going on between Orson's mom and Alma. And it seems like they both hate Orson. And Orson's mom genuinely believes this because she was cheated on a lot. She has this history of it. And so she doesn't like the idea of anyone cheating. And she doesn't like that Orson cheated on Alma. So she would actually be happy for Orson and Alma to end up together because in her mind that's right. Therefore she considers Brie a slut and she considers that woman who died, Monique, a slut as well. Towards the end of the season she ends up trying to murder Brie and make it look like Brie committed suicide in the bathtub. Now luckily Andrew and Orson arrive to save the day and at that point it's pretty obvious that Orson is like not a bad guy and he's just been trying to protect his mother because she knew that Orson had been cheating with Monique. She hates sluts so she killed 
Monique. And then Orson came in at the last minute and freaked out and had to help cover up the murder and bury the body. And then Orson's mum pulled out the teeth so it would be unidentifiable. But that's why Mike was sort of caught up in it because he'd arrived that same night to do a plumbing job and walked in. That made Orson really paranoid that maybe Mike had seen something and had just pretended not to notice. And that's why when Orson moves into Wisteria Lane and realizes that Mike lives there, he freaks out when Mike recognizes him and hits him with his car because his mum told him to. She said, if he remembers something, if he knows something, we can't risk that because he can put us both in jail. And yes, it was awful for Orson to do, but at that point it makes sense. And he felt indebted to help his mother because even though he doesn't like her, he feels like he owes her something. When he was younger, his dad had killed himself. And because Orson was off doing other things, he wasn't responsible and he wasn't there to take care of his dad and he feels guilty about it. And Orson's mom always uses that against him to guilt trip him, so it makes sense, right? When Orson comes in towards the end and he sees his mum trying to kill Brie in the bathtub, it gives him a vivid flashback to when he was younger and when he found his dad dead in the bathtub. And it makes him realize that actually his dad didn't end his own life. It was murder and it was her fault. And with that information it changes everything for Orson and he realizes he needs to cut ties with his mum completely so he saves Brie and then he pushes his mum away from her and because she's quite old his mum ends up having a stroke. Gloria locked up Alma. Alma tried to escape by climbing out the window but then she fell off the roof and actually died. Alma had written this fake suicide note to try and get Orson's attention and manipulate him into wanting her in her handwriting. He put it next to her body to make it sound like she killed herself over the fact that maybe she'd killed Monique so it was sort of setting Alma up for the murder of Monique. Then he moved his mum's paralyzed body next to Alma and it worked because it looked like Alma had committed suicide and then the next morning Gloria, Orson's mum, had stumbled across the body and had a stroke from the shock of it and I loved how everything came together. I thought Gloria was an incredible villain. I loved how hard it was to follow and figure out and it was amazing and this is only the summary like it was so much more complicated than that. The only thing I don't like about this mystery storyline is the R.A. PE. I don't really want to say it, but it was skimmed over and I really disliked that. Basically, as a way of trying to get Orson to love her again, Alma tries to seduce him by drugging him, being intimate with him, hoping that she'd get pregnant with his kid, and then out of obligation to her, he'd leave Brie. It was extremely disturbing and horrible, and yet, when he and Brie find out what happened, he's just like, oh, my mom and Alma organized to have this happen to me. Wow, the lengths they go to, huh? That doesn't make sense. Like, this would traumatize you for, at the very least months but probably years or the rest of your life to know you were violated like that and already male sexual assault is not taken seriously enough so I just find it really hard to believe that it would have no emotional impact on Orson whatsoever. The rest worked really well but it was just that one thing and the mystery like I just explained was so awesome. When I look back on the show so far Susan was the best in season one, Brie was the best in season two and Gabby and Brie were both the best in season three. There could have been more of an emphasis, like I mentioned earlier, on developing pre-existing storylines rather than rushing into new ones. They waste a lot of good material, like the emotional impact on Orson after being violated like that, the pedo vs net storyline, Edie's regrets and shame after things didn't work out with Mike should have been greater, considering she wanted to take him away from Susan for a long time, then she got him, and then it wasn't all it was cracked up to be and she was actually unsatisfied. Also, Austin and Julie's romance, Austin just leaves what happened with that and what happened to Mike's interactions with his son Zach. He wanted so long to connect with Zach, prove he loved him, to be a good dad to him. Paul Young's in jail now too so Mike has the opportunity to spend time with Zach and yet he's not. Even when Zach came back to town to try and seduce Gabby, where was Mike when all of that was happening, you know? I would really have appreciated that stuff to be developed more. But aside from that I thought season three was freaking amazing and it's going to be hard to top it and to find something as good as that. I will definitely for sure be re-watching it in the future but now before I get into season four and what happens then just go get yourself some tea let's just have a little interval rest break and then I will be back with you shortly I'm back. As I was saying, season three was basically a masterclass in how to do a mystery and how to do it well, where things added up, 
they made sense but season four wasn't quite as good in my opinion the finale and the way they wrapped it up was really anticlimactic and underwhelming and unsatisfying in terms of my overall thoughts about season four aside from the finale i really liked it i thought it was very strong i loved the addition of Catherine as a character to like the main cast i thought she was really a great choice Catherine is a new woman who moves onto the street with her husband Adam and her daughter Dylan and the other women don't know her except for Susan because apparently years ago Catherine lived on Wisteria Lane in the same house she's now moved back into. In season two with the Applewhite family the stakes felt very low because the Applewhites were so disconnected from the rest of the main cast. I get that Betty Applewhite needed to create distance and avoid the other women for her own protection of not getting too close to anyone but as a result you feel really alienated from from her story and it's kind of hard to care when the other women don't even have an attachment to her but season four is the most distinctive and impressive by far with how they incorporate and mold Catherine into the storyline with every main woman and that's what makes it so powerful Gabby and her have a bit of a moment where they butt heads because she thinks Gabby's flirting with her husband Susan already knew her from years back so they have that kind of history and Susan introduces her to the other women and tries to welcome her into the group that interconnected feeling is highlighted because of the fact that Catherine already has a connection to Wisteria Lane. She used to live there and then for whatever reason in weird circumstances like Susan remembers Catherine started being weird with Susan and then suddenly she just disappeared and moved out and no one knew why she left and now she's moved back in as if nothing happened. Another thing I loved is the rivalry and the frenemies dynamic that starts to form between Brie and Catherine. Brie's never really had a competitor before in that sense where she's actually jealous of someone and competing with someone like Susan's had it with Edie but season four was Bree's opportunity to go face to face with Catherine because when Catherine arrives the thing you need to understand about her if I have to summarize her personality she's excellent at making enemies and so when she sees that the other women sort of turn to Bree as a leader Catherine doesn't like it because she's very dominating and controlling she's also very secretive about why she moved out those years ago about her ex-husband who we don't know anything about and even with her current husband Adam she does not tell him stuff she never tells her daughter anything and so Catherine's kind of a closed book to the other women as well Catherine was the main reason that I loved season four I thought that she was an excellent new character another reason I liked season four is because there's a shift in the story where the girls go from being quite distant from each other and never telling each other stuff to agreeing that they need to start sharing important things with each other. I just want to talk about each of the women so we'll start off with Susan. Susan went really downhill in season four if I'm entirely honest. At the end of season three when Susan was dehydrated <laughs> and lost on a hiking trip looking for Mike she realized that because she's looking for drama all the time she put herself in that situation and it gives her this cathartic realization that she can't be like that anymore and if she ever gets out of that situation she needs to stop being such a drama queen and she swears to herself that she's not going to do that anymore. She clearly says she wants to be better and then does nothing about it. A lot of the critiques I hear about Susan say that she's selfish. I'm not seeing her so far as any more selfish than Gabby or Edie. Nothing that bad happens in her life for the most part but yet she makes it so much worse than it actually needs to be and that if anything is my problem with Susan. And her clumsiness has become really annoying now like at first it was kind of cute and endearing but now it's like they're just trying way too hard to make her likable we knew she'd set Edie's house on fire in like season one and that was already bad enough because her clumsiness was actually affecting other people but in season three she accidentally sets her mother-in-law on fire when she was engaged to Ian going to marry him she accidentally drives her car into a lake and then Mike has to come and save her and Ian and then in season four again the clumsiness is just continuing with people's constant jokes around Susan not being able to cook and her avoiding it 
because she's so clumsy and it's like learn to cook girl it's honestly pathetic <laughs> It's not even cute. It's just really annoying. And at one point, Susan's southern mother-in-law arrives and criticizes Susan for not being a complete housewife. And she was very rude, okay, unintentionally so, but rude. But the one good thing she did is she'd brought all her cooking utensils with her and she was totally on board to help Susan learn how to cook and she was going to teach her. And Susan was just like, oh, trust me, I'm a danger to everyone. And she just doesn't even try. She also meets her ex-husband Carl and his new wife and they're pregnant with a baby on the way. It's really exciting. Susan's pregnant as well. And she's like, his life is perfect and mine isn't. And she's really insecure. And I'm thinking, why did you marry Mike and choose him over Ian? If now in season four, you're gonna be so ungrateful and unsatisfied for the life you do have. Like, I don't see the issue. She's married with a baby on the way. Carl's married and now has a baby on the way. So you can just be happy for each other, but she's not. And then when she sees Mike, she tells him that he'll need to lie to Carl and pretend they have more money than they do and more success than they do. Susan chose Mike. He's a plumber. He works until late. They can't have the big fancy lifestyle. He can't fly her off to Paris every weekend. That's how it works. She chose him. She could have had the opportunity to go with the millionaire British Ian in season three and she turned it down. Susan also annoys me in season four because they suddenly have her turn into a massive conflict avoider. She went from a bit avoidant to being actually pathetic, like a complete doormat. Catherine and Adam divorce and they separate. And then the girls go to bring her some food to look after her and see how she's doing. And Catherine's really rude to them and basically says, you shouldn't have come here. And yet Susan sort of starts apologizing for the other girls being like, oh yeah, we shouldn't have come. And it's just really pathetic. Like she cannot stand up for herself. Then she meets her new neighbors. There are two gay men who move in down the street and I'm not sure how big a role they'll play in the show, but Susan is desperate for them to like her. She does everything she can, including like stealing their dog so she can pretend to have saved the dog and they'll be grateful to her. And she just needs their validation so badly to the point that it's embarrassing. She and Mike are negotiating their different parenting styles. They're aware that parenting Julie will be hard because Julie's biologically not Mike's child, right? But then they hear about this crazy party that Julie wants to go to. Susan's happy for her to go, Mike isn't because he's worried. And then since Susan wants to please both of them and she can't make a decision between who to side with, she sort of ends up lying to Mike and pretending she hasn't let Julie go to the party when she has. That night when she hears the party's getting really wild, she freaks out and thinks she needs to go and help Julie. So still in her lingerie with like, a jacket thrown over her that's barely not at all covering her boobs. She rushes out to the party to go and check on Julie and bring her home and make sure she's okay. Mock offended when some of the guys at the party think she's a stripper and it really annoys me how often in the show they find an opportunity to put Susan in lingerie or be naked. It's infuriating. Julie gets an opportunity for a huge internship over the summer. I get that it's upsetting when your child leaves the nest. Like, it's hard. It was just so rude the way that Susan handled it because she kept making up these excuses and lying to Julie saying she didn't have the money for Julie to do the internship. But the fact was she just didn't want to be separated from Julie and was lying to her about it because she felt like she needed those three extra months with Julie. Why bother lying to her and have her miss out on a potentially amazing opportunity? And the only reason Julie ended up managing to go was because Mike called Susan out on her behavior, which is something he should do more often because I feel like so often he just lets her get away with stuff. Then at the end of season four, Susan has her baby and Mike wants to give it this really weird name. It's a very unusual name and he'll probably get bullied. Rather than just telling Mike straight up sorry the name's too strange I don't like it she lies and pretends she likes it and then she goes behind Mike's back to try and have the name changed without his permission then she's a drama queen again because Mike gets confirmation that Orson was the one who hit him in that hit and run and Mike is pretty forgiving about it because he realizes that it was a mistake not a mistake but Orson feels terrible about it the guilt is tearing Orson apart and that's all Mike needs to feel good about it is just the reassurance that Orson won't do it again and feels bad. But Susan freaks out and she's like, oh my God, I cannot believe that Bree's husband 
nearly killed you. And rather than just processing it privately with Mike, she storms into Brie and Orson's house and starts yelling at Orson, saying what a terrible person he is. And Brie didn't know this about Orson. She had no idea. That was the one thing he didn't tell her. It makes a significant rift in their relationship. There was another point where she wanted to know Brie's gynecologist. And Brie doesn't want to tell her because Brie's not actually pregnant. So she doesn't actually need one right now. So she doesn't have one to recommend. But Susan's like, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Then Brie ended up giving her some random gynecologist just to get Susan off her back. And Susan goes and it's, I mean, it was a very funny scene, but it was a really disgusting office and the seats were dirty. And Susan was like, oh my God, what's this? But then when Susan comes back, she demands an explanation from Brie as to why Brie lied to her and gave her a fake recommendation. Again, not Susan's business. Maybe stay out of it. It's like she's a teenage girl. Even like I said, with the fact that she behaves in a curiously childish way sometimes, it just makes me confused when people say that they detest Susan, but they love Gabby and Edie. I just don't get it when someone like Gabby has done way worse things than Susan since day one has been horrible. I mean, for one, she slept with a teenager multiple times and was pursuing a relationship with him. Susan never did that. Carlos got hit in the eye and it made him go blind during a hurricane. Since then, when Gabby's with Carlos, she mistreats him so much because she can take advantage of the fact that he's blind and vulnerable. He's not in a position to defend himself as well because he can't see her. Watching her behave like that towards someone who's effectively disabled, it's just really nasty. And Susan's never pulled stunts like that. She wouldn't dare. So I'm just saying the hate is very disproportionate when you compare her to the other women at least in my experience so far but the next girl I do want to talk about is Gabby because I was literally just talking about her I really enjoyed Gabby's storylines in season four she's so much more interesting than she was in season one and season two she starts being unhappy in her relationship with Victor in season four because she hates how he puts his political career above her she's saying she just wants to be loved to be treated like a princess she did it with Carlos when he was off working and making loads of money when they were rich she was annoyed that he wasn't home enough and now when Victor's off trying to get money she gets annoyed that he's not giving her attention all the time. She fights two men in wheelchairs because she wants their parking space, which was really uncomfortable. When Carlos goes blind after a hurricane, she makes it all about herself. I had to clean your toothbrush this morning. Do you know how much I've sacrificed for you? I have to do this. I have to do that. She starts fighting with the man who gave her a ticket because she thinks that as the mayor's wife, she should be able to get away with it. Then she tries to take advantage of Carlos's blindness when she gets back with him after separating from Victor by parking in all the handicapped spaces. Carlos decides to adopt a dog to help him with his blindness. Then Gabby doesn't like the dog, so tries to get rid of it without Carlos's permission. Obviously, I'm mentioning both Victor and Carlos, so it may be confusing as to which one she's with. But basically, she starts off season four in a relationship with Victor still, but cheating on him the whole time with Carlos. Then Gabby was paranoid that Victor would find out she cheated on him because he might do terrible things to her. They went on this boat trip together, and she was really worried that he was going to kill her or hurt her because he literally told her, hey, I know about you and Carlos. Carlos and she was like wait you know how long have you known for and they were on a boat alone and she freaked out and so she hit him with an oar and he fell into the water and then she came back to save him Carlos arrived too to help and then Victor felt really annoyed that Carlos was there and he tried to fight Carlos Gabrielle had to push Victor into the water again and he nearly drowned apparently all he wanted was to love her but he doesn't really treat her that way so it's confusing but during the hurricane once he's out of hospital he pursues Carlos with a gun but then he gets impaled by a flying object and dies and at the same time Carlos is hit in the head with um, another flying object and that's what makes him blind. Then Gabby gets back with Carlos officially and can marry him and she's actually really happy to be with him again despite the fact that he's blind. They realize they need money and they're having financial problems so they rent out a section of their house. So this woman comes to live there and she's called Ellie. Gabby starts suspecting that Ellie is sleeping with men for money because she's having weird men coming in and out of her room and it's looking really dodgy. Another character I want to talk about is Edie. One of the things that really rubbed me the wrong way about Edie in season four and three is that they've really robbed her of her self-respect. She complicates things when she finds out about Carlos's illegal offshore bank account in the Cayman Islands. So she's trying to use that to threaten him as some sort of edge or way of him staying 
staying with her or blackmailing him into being with her. And then she tries to kiss Orson and Brie is obviously furious so she tries to sabotage Edie's real estate job. And rather than Edie reflecting and understanding, she tries to bite back at Brie by blackmailing her. And that was just one step too far. Like that was ridiculous. Brie tells her friends what's going on and that she's being blackmailed with this fake pregnancy. And that's the first time she tells the girls that she was never actually pregnant. So the girls go to Edie and they say that they're done with her. This is the final straw and they will no longer associate with her. And then Edie has the nerve to actually be upset and shocked that they don't want to be her friends. Even when she'd blackmailed Brie, her terms were that Brie invited her to events with her friends if Brie treated her like a friend. Those were her terms and conditions. It's actually really heartbreaking because she just wants friends so badly and to be included, but yet she doesn't know how because she goes about it always in the wrong way. If you're going around blackmailing people, how will you ever expect them to like you? Now let's talk about Brie. Brie's interesting because she was freaking unreal in season two and three, but then in season four, I felt like she took a bit of a step back from the limelight and she was still a great character, but because I'm just almost vlogging my experiences of the show as I go along, my feelings will keep changing, but she's definitely not my favorite now. One of Brie's major storylines in season four was her trying to hide her fake pregnancy from her neighbors because she doesn't want anyone to know that her daughter was the one who was pregnant. I guess because she finds that stuff shameful because her daughter Danielle wasn't actually married when she had sex. But it was very, very funny to see Brie walking around with this massive fake baby bump pretending to be pregnant. And it put her in a lot of awkward situations. They're at a barbecue and there's this big sharp fork used and it slices right into Brie's stomach and punctures it. And she's just walking around with this knife effectively sticking out of her stomach not realizing I nearly actually peed myself laughing but Brie is happy to raise this baby and pretend it's her own because she wants it to be like a parenting do-over for herself and she is really worried about her daughter Danielle not being the best mum. so she feels like she should take care of the baby now as lovely as that is I felt like it was extremely selfish and that's why I'm saying that Susan isn't the only selfish character in the show you know to cut Susan some slack I mean seriously Brie excuses I deserve a parenting do-over Danielle would be a terrible mother anyway she's too young she needs to go to uni I need to look after the baby without actually asking Danielle what she wanted or considering the fact that maybe Danielle would want to be a mum. It's not about you, Brie. I don't care how much you want a parenting do-over. It's not your child. And I felt like she was sort of taking ownership already of Danielle's unborn baby, forgetting that she has two other kids, Andrew and Danielle, who need her. And I don't care if she feels like she made some mistakes parenting them. She's pushing them away by acting as if she's ashamed of them, to the point that Andrew wants to move out because he feels like she just doesn't love him. Also, what bothers me is this show is weirdly pro-life. They don't even use the word abortion in the show, and no one, like, mentions the possibility that they don't have to keep the baby. Like, what's up with that? Is there a reason for that? I don't get it. When Gabby got pregnant in season one, forcibly impregnated, might I add, because she didn't want the baby, she was like, okay, I guess I'm pregnant, so I'll go with it. Then when the baby comes along in season four, Brie really wants the child to be circumcised. What bothered me is that Orson had a really traumatic history with being circumcised himself as a child, and he also had some strong views in it about lack of sexual pleasure for the man once they have it, and he was really against their child, Benjamin, having it when Benjamin's born. And yet Brie just goes ahead and has the child circumcised without Orson's permission. And the worst part is because Orson's such a doormat when it comes to Brie, he forgave her in about two minutes and he didn't even yell at her. How can you be so forgiving? She went behind your back and made this huge decision. What the hell? Also, Brie can be really hurtful when she wants to be. Like, she knows where to stick the knife. When her and Orson are arguing, if she ever really wants to hurt him, she'll make some comment about Benjamin not actually being his biological kid anyway. And so Brie knows how much it will hurt to remind him, oh, actually, it's not really your kid, is it? Which I also thought was really mean. She kept insisting that Orson turned himself into the police for trying to kill Mike. 
back. I'll love you, but only if you turn yourself in. Bree's done illegal stuff before. She didn't turn herself in, so I don't know why she's taking the moral high ground. I mean, she broke and entered into Catherine's house to steal a recipe. And when she sat and watched George die in season two, she never turned herself in for that. And he'd spend years in jail potentially. Would you really want your kids to not have a father because he's in jail? Mike is the one that should be asked about this. Mike had forgiven Orson. Mike was cool with it. So why are you getting angry on Mike's behalf about something that's got nothing to do with you? Like, what? The final girl I want to talk about is Lynette. And this may shock you guys, but she was my favorite character in season four. This is Lynette I'm talking about, who was always one of my least favorites. As soon as she got cancer, she had a really big perspective shift and she started being more grateful and present with her kids and appreciative of what she did have. And she gets into survivor's guilt a lot, questioning the meaning of life and why she got to live and other people didn't. They also address Kayla, who lost her mom in the previous season. And Kayla is a very manipulative child. Even before her mother was shot, she was always messed up. She's a very abnormal child. She's manipulative. She turns people against each other, doesn't form normal emotional attachments. Psychologists or social workers kept trying to make out that it was somehow Lynette's fault for not loving Kayla enough. Kayla's formative years were not with Lynette. She spent them with her mum, Nora, for like the first seven years of her life, which is when your subconscious is developed and everything and your core beliefs are formed. Whenever anything goes wrong, it's like everyone blames Lynette. And that's just not true. Lynette's trying to explain explain it to Tom and he's not listening to her and he's taking Kayla's side. He doesn't listen properly when Lynette tries to talk to him about things. He's just the worst husband ever. Like seriously. So I was really glad when he finally came to his senses and actually realized. Although I don't remember him apologizing to Lynette. He really should have. The final thing I want to talk about from season four is the mystery plot because as amazing as season four was, unfortunately, the finale and the mystery was the reason why I can only give it like a four out of five rather than a five out of five five-star rating. Catherine has a lot of secrets to do with her ex-husband. She never talks about him and she won't tell Dylan anything about her biological father. Dylan has a lot of memory loss issues from her childhood. She apparently used to live there on the street and apparently used to be best friends with Julie. And Julie has all these memories and photos of them together and Dylan's just not remembering any of it. Julie feels like Dylan's not just got some memory loss issues, she is a different child altogether. It's as if she's been replaced with a new kid. And that's when I was pretty much certain that Dylan wasn't actually Dylan, that maybe the original Dylan had died and was replaced. And it was kind of sad that I guessed the plot twist in like the first episode because that's what ends up happening. It's so compelling. Why has she been replaced? Does Dylan have amnesia from trauma or is she actually not Dylan at all? So many questions and intrigue and suspicion around Catherine. And when you get the answers, it's not half as fulfilling as you would think it would be considering how masterfully they set it up. Julie and Dylan break into Dylan's old room where Dylan used to sleep when they first lived on Wisteria Lane. And when Catherine catches them, she's furious, which makes her seem guilty, right? Like she's hiding something, like she's done something bad. It makes it sound as if Catherine killed the original Dylan on purpose or something and replaced her with a new child. What she did wasn't half as bad as I thought it would be or as much as the show was making it out to be. There's also this really pointless storyline where we found out that Catherine slept with Susan's cousin when he was 16 and took his virginity. Catherine was judging Gabby for sleeping with John, the underage gardener, and saying, how dare you, you're a predator. But Catherine did the exact same thing. Who is she to talk? That makes no sense. Catherine's ex-husband arrives, who Dylan's never really talked to for years, and he starts trying to connect with Dylan and pretending he cares about her. He's questioning if Dylan is even his or not, like if Catherine cheated on him or what the deal is. Right towards the end of the season, we're treated to a flashback and it's Catherine's flashback. We see her sitting in the police station talking to an officer and Catherine's covered in bruises. The policewoman rifles through papers and realizes that Catherine's husband is Wayne Davis, one of their patrolmen. And the policewoman says, your husband's a police officer. He's got a lot of friends around here. Of course you could press charges, but I can't guarantee that one of his friends won't lose the paperwork again. Get as much money as you can and grab your daughter and run. And that's why she went to Wisteria Lane the first time because she was escaping from her husband so it was just her and her child moving 
moving in. And then her child, Dylan, started to form a friendship with Julie and they were getting along. A few months passed and she convinced herself that her husband had forgotten about her. And then one day Mary Alice, who was actually babysitting her daughter, said that this strange man had turned up at the house. And so she ends up taking her daughter and running out of Wisteria Lane in a rush. Catherine works as a villain to be shady and bitchy and conniving. And then we find out she's just a victim of a horrible husband. And she made one big mistake, sure, but like it was nothing compared to what Wayne did. Yet we spent so much time setting her up as a villain. A wardrobe fell on her daughter and crushed her. It had nothing to do with the main plot. Her daughter was just killed and it was a complete accident. And she knew that Wayne really wanted to have a relationship with his daughter and take her away. So she was worried about him being angry or something? Why feel the need to lie and then get a girl from an orphanage and call her Dylan and replace your dead child with a new child? Why would you be so secretive about where Dylan came from? Why couldn't you just give her a new name, adopt a new child? Why do you need to pretend she's Dylan? That doesn't make sense. Why couldn't she have just told Dylan the truth about who she was rather than brainwashing her and lying to her and pretending to be her real mom? Why couldn't she have told Dylan more information about her abusive ex-husband so Dylan could understand why Catherine was trying to keep her away from him rather than acting like a total cow whenever Dylan brings him up? Why does she keep making herself look guilty throughout the entire series? And why gaslight your daughter and brainwash her? Why would you do that? There's no motive. There's no reason to go that far. It doesn't make sense. If you're so confident your husband will never be able to track you down again, then why keep up this lie? Pretending you've got your daughter alive still. And how does Dylan have no memories of her childhood? Surely she'd remember being in the orphanage. I don't know what I was expecting, but something better than the answers I got. The worst thing about the finale is the final three minutes, which left a sour taste in my mouth and I felt like it was really poorly done. After Catherine kills her ex-husband when he comes back to attack her and she tells Dylan the truth finally about who she is and the whole season wraps up beautifully, we get a time jump five years into the future. It's a very rushed three minutes, quickly jumping between each of the girls to show where they're at and what they're up to, looking completely different in different relationships or doing different things with their kids older. And we're just meant to process this huge info dump. It's hard to connect them to the characters we've just seen. I have no issue with a time jump. If they wanna do a time jump five years into the future, be my guest, I think it's a great idea. I really think they could have given us like a solid 10 minutes on each character showing where they're at before they randomly skip and go into the next one because they really threw us into the deep end there and I would have appreciated it if they just slowed it down. Now I know it sounds negative, I'm just saying that it disappointed me. I actually really loved season three and four and it's probably one of my favorite shows. So it might sound like I'm nitpicking and I am. Overall as a whole, this show is really amazing and really juicy and the characters are compelling and I would still really 10 out of 10 recommend you watch it and I cannot wait to watch more. The ideas they come up with are amazing. I don't know how you can have the creativity to come up with so many unique ideas. But I definitely think this was like the golden era of the show for sure. Like I don't see how it can get much better than season three and four because every episode was so juicy. And even when the mystery let me down in season four, I found that I didn't really care that much because it was so enjoyable to watch anyway you know but let me know what you guys think in the comments thank you so much for watching make sure to follow me on instagram and subscribe and give this video a thumbs up if you want to see me talk about this show more and i will see you for the next video bye